game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. This is Ramdas here and now. I'm Raghu Marcus with another episode, which uh, this week is actually a part two from the last episode that we did with Ramdas, which is a uh, Q and A that he did at Omega in July 1992. There were some other great questions and even better responses from Ramdas, so I wanted to share those with you. But before we go there. I want to uh, mention something about uh, the film that we have coming out of Ramdas. The it's a, the arc of his life and teachings. It's a wonderful full-length documentary about uh, just under an hour and a half, and it was directed by Jamie Cotto, who did One Giant Leap, and it's been worked on for about four years, and it's going to see the light of day. Actually, it's going to open, uh, its first public viewing will be at the Maui Film Festival, so Ram Dass will have an opportunity to be there, which is a, a fun idea, and uh, I'm going to be there as well. And that's June 14th, uh, And uh, but the uh, theatrical opening, which will open in specific theaters ac across the country uh, on September 6th in Los Angeles and San Francisco. It's going to move to to the Northwest through Portland, and then uh, it'll be in Boulder and Santa Fe and Tucson and uh, Albuquerque, and then New York and Philly and like that. And you can go to becomingnobody.com and check it out and watch the trailer. And also, we really do need help from everybody because. Uh, as you can imagine, it uh, takes a lot of resources and particularly green energy to be able to uh, release this theatrically on our own because the foundation is uh, uh, the producer along with uh, and presenter along with our friends at Google Empathy Lab. So uh, what we've done is we've set up a crowdfunding and we'd really appreciate if those of you who feel like supporting getting this picture out and Ram Dass's life work out to a, uh, a larger audience beyond, say, the choir, uh, go to Propeller, P-R-O-P-E-L-L-E-R dot L-A slash Becoming Nobody. And, you know, there's rewards and uh, a video about what we're doing. And, of course, the trailer is up, is there. So, uh, would love the support. Okay, that's all the announcements for today. Uh, so, there's a bunch of different questions, as I said, uh, that uh, that are asked to round us at this uh, retreat at Omega. And the first one is all about ego and its place in our being. And uh, he basically talks about it as a, our control mechanism. And, and I think many of us have heard uh, that uh, wonderful quote that I, I don't know. He didn't know. And I'm not sure I know. It's maybe a Ramana Maharshi or Sri Ramakrishna, but ego is a beautiful servant, but a terrible master. Right? And we get lost in separateness when we believe that this control mechanism is who we are. Ain't it so? Um, so uh, there's a a good perspective from him uh, on that control mechanism. I think this is, of course, central to our ability to move beyond our little meanness. And, and you know, a lot of this is around attachment, too. Uh, and, of course, that's the root of, of our behavior system in terms of 
pushing away unpleasantness and desiring comfort and pleasantness. Uh, and so there's a bunch of talk around that. And it all fits into this control mechanism. So, um, And Ram Dass talks about something that actually pissed me off. <laughs> Because he talks about, you know, getting detached from stuff. And so he was moving or something and he had a whole boxes and boxes of memorabilia and this and that that he, you know, that it's just like we all do collect over the years. He went and put it in a bonfire. Okay. And now in my job as the uh, director of Love Server Member Foundation, we've been collecting all of his memorabilia to set up a library. And then I listen to this and I go, holy Jesus, you, you went and burned this stuff? Is that supposed to get you detached? And he even talks about it. Uh, it's not the stuff, it's the attachment. But anyhow, he did do that and here we are r rustling around trying to collect <laughs> everything of his to preserve it for future generations to be able to share uh insights into his life. Uh, there's also some stuff around anger, my favorite subject. Those of you who listen to Mind Rolling, we do a lot of uh, investigation of that. Uh, and you know, he, he said a great thing here. How much does your awareness cling to the anger? That clinging is, of course, to all of or any of the defilements, as the Buddhists call them, is uh, endemic to our just being glued to the habitual pattern, right? Isn't it so? So creating spaciousness is paramount to being able to cut down the reactive nature. This is, in my mind, to uh, when this, this boiling comes up, this anger comes up. So the cultivating of spaciousness, of course, is, uh, is done through meditative practices, which is, again, not just meditative practices, any practice that will help broaden this uh, sense that you are not your thoughts, you are not your emotions. And once you broaden that out a little bit, that creates a space from which you are not just knee-jerk reacting to incoming uh, artillery, <laughs> okay, if you, uh, as we might say, which triggers these really, really uh, difficult emotions and anger, of course. Uh, when you invest, this is Ram Dass, when you invest in the anger with identification, you ultimately polarize and create more suffering. Right? Ain't that true? Um, let's see, some other question. This is a good one. Letting go of the process of being special, right? And we all have that. We all have that. And especially, of course, in relationships. Uh, and, you know, when you really have awareness and develop a re awareness, you, you, you see that your personality is insatiable for that validation, and all of this, of course, as Ramda says, is related to feeling, feelings of, of lack of self-love. That is a huge thing. You know, we were talking, to, we were just at a retreat in, in Maui and talking about love and talking about love everyone, which is Maharaji's uh, statement to Ramda, tell the truth and love everyone. And uh, somebody, I think Ramesh said, yes, yeah, start with yourself, love everyone. So... Uh, yeah, that's a biggie. Self-worth, self-love. Um, and uh, Ram Dass says here, personality is like sandpaper. It's the stuff of the incarnation. So again, that's, that's more of creating the kind of spaciousness that allows us not to get trapped in believing this stuff that we walk around with, the me-me thing day to day. Um... Oh, somebody talked about being a lawyer and how do you be an adversarial lawyer, you know, trying to win your case but still keep your heart open. And then he referred to the Gita 
and and the whole thing with Arjun saying to Krishna, I cannot. He drops his sword. You know, this is the uh, if you well, you must read the Gita. Anybody out there, please get a copy. Uh, there's so many different translations of it, uh, and this is about. Uh, Arjun dropping his sword and said, I cannot fight. These people are my family because it was a war, you know, a tribe that split apart. And um, and this is all about everyone has, you know, for the dance to go on, everyone has a part to play and the idea is to play it without attachment. So there's that theme running through this whole Q&A around our gluing ourselves to stuff attachment and uh, that causes our identification with separateness so this is a a great uh, um, very very perceptive and insightful uh, answer to this this question of being able to act and it's also he talks a lot about the political arena actually the latter part of the talk uh, which is the same thing. It's acting. This is something that we are part of society. We Our incarnation uh, is not something to be ignored. I mean, I mean, the participation in what our incarnation dictates is not something to be ignored. So uh, taking action in a political arena is part of the part we have to play. But when we're either not working on ourselves to get as clean as possible and being able to do this with love and not with anger, uh, that's the key. So is there's a dharmic way to act within all of the roles that we have as a result of our incarnation. I think that's the, and he says it, we have to honor our incarnation and play our parts. Um, yeah. Pretty great talk, actually. In, uh, not a talk, pretty great Q&A um, that, that really uh, runs through, as I say, this central theme of the way in which attachment really uh, creates the kind of polarity and separation that does not allow us to fulfill our dharmic destinies. Well, that sounds really hoity-toity. Uh, all right, without further adieu, as I like to say, here is Ramdas from Omega in 1992, July. And uh, the second part of the Q&A. So enjoy, and uh, we will s and check out everybody else, all the other wonderful podcasters on BeHereNowNetwork.com. And uh, when you go to uh, listen to this podcast, we'll have some nice links that will refer to some of the things Ramdas is talking about to further investigate them. And don't forget Becoming Nobody, right? That's what this is all about. The movie Becoming Nobody uh, really tells uh, the, the story of uh, our journey. Ramdas's journey is our journey. See you next week on Ramdas Here and Now. We speak about the ego and its place in our being. Um, in order to find, I'll, I'll do the, the, it's kind of the light, cute one a little bit, but it, we can start from there. In order to function on this plane, you need a control mechanism a phenomenological field, a, a, a model in your head about who you are and who you aren't and how it works so that when there's a fire and a stove, you don't stick your hand in it in the first place. And so you function and you function with other people. And it is a, it's like, uh, it looks like you put on a space suit and it comes with a control center, a little computer in it that runs it so it does all the right things. The question is, is that who you are? And most people, when they were born, get bought into their separateness and the control mechanism of their separateness, which is what the ego is. And it's a beautiful mechanism. And as, uh, as Vivekananda 
said, I guess it was Vivekananda Ramakrishna, said the, the, the ego is a beautiful servant, but a terrible master. And the image they give in India is of a, a wagon, a carriage being drawn by horses, and there's a, somebody up on top with, uh, guiding the horses, and then inside the carriage, uh, it's dark. And for all this time, the, the horseman's been driving the horses. And then there is a tap on the top of the carriage roof. And the person the being inside the carriage says, would you stop the carriage? And the horseman says, who are you? And the guy inside says, I own the carriage. Says, what do you mean you own the carriage? I've never seen you before. I'm the one that runs the carriage and owns the carriage. And this is the moment of the awakening that who you think you are isn't who you really are, that there's somebody inside the carriage. And it turns the ego into the servant. And most people, the, and the ego is very clever in not wanting to be, lose its power. Because the ego doesn't only lives in the domain of power, it doesn't live in the merging quality of oneness. So it realizes it's its own survival is at stake, and the funny thing is it's going to die, and then it will be perfectly functional as a useful little thing to have around to use when you need it. You have an ego, and I have an ego, and our egos will play with each other, and behind them, you here, I'm here, far out, isn't it? Great egos we got, isn't it? You know, It's that quality. And it's like, it's, it's vertical schizophrenia. It's vertical schizophrenia, and it's a very functional thing, and... Most people have, they talk about, I mean, most psychology was around ego strength and ego this and competence and coping and adjustment and all that. And then along came people like Maslow and Jung and people like that arrived and said, behind all that, there's something else. There's something else. And uh, that's what the whole root of mysticism is about. There's something else. The question was asked, if we're not supposed to be attached then what do we do about our personal possessions? And the question about possessions um, relates to the issue of voluntary simplicity. Um, that as you increase, as you open to deeper awareness in which you identify with more and more of everything and everybody, um, I want to stay close to my truth about this. This is tricky. You know, I mean, I'm thinking about my MG and I'm thinking about, you know, all my stuff as I'm talking to you, you know, like I just moved out of my house and, uh, cause it was sold out from under me in Marin. And so I put everything into one of those big shipping containers you rent, you know, those places, storage place. And I put it in, and there was the couch, and the bed, and the bureau, and the books, and the papers, and the this is and the that's, and the chutchkeys, and all the little things people have given me, and all of the things, and my father's old cane, and I mean, just stuff, all my old family pictures, everything. And then we had two padlocks, and we locked it up. And do you know, at that moment, if those keys got lost, you know, I don't know that I'd be the least bit unhappy. I thought they've served all those things beautifully. But there was a moment when I really realized I had to just let go of stuff. And so I had a, uh, a fire. In enough is enough. So I decided to have a big fire. So I said, you know, I brought stuff, love letters, goodbye. I'll never see this letter again. And I'd throw it to the fire. And I was doing fine, and my friends started to get into it, and they were bringing me stuff to throw into the fire. And I was doing fine till I got to the pictures of my guru. And then I said, oh, no, 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 not yet. I'm still a too attached. So I, I you know, the first I said, well, I'm going to get rid of all these stuff. So I put it out by the trash. I went through it and put it out in the trash. And then I found in the middle of the night, I was out there going through the trash, because I remembered a thing I'd never see again, and I was freaking over it. So I, uh, I got rid of about eight boxes then, down to the, only the real valuable ones. And uh, 
<laughs> so, but you know, the thing is, I just took care of my father's estate. My father was a guy that filed everything. I mean, old laundry slips, everything. He had files and then lists of files, and then those were filed. I mean, he was incredible what he had, and he had everything cataloged. I mean, old slides that were, didn't come out. I mean, he had it all, you know? I mean, it was incredible. Yeah. And there was this huge edifice around him, and then he died out from under it. And it's like, you know, a turtle, and the turtle dies, and you're left with a shell. I mean, I didn't know, and I found, you know, because when I was little, those file cabinets were full of important papers. Those were Dad's papers. And now I found myself taking them to the dump. Taking Dad's important papers to the dump. And I felt like I was profaning his whole life by doing that. Can you hear, you hear the issue? And I, I resolved to keep lightening my game as much as I could. But when you have beautiful things that are part of the beauty of your life, of course, enjoy them. What happens is, as you keep becoming more uh, light in your consciousness, you feel less desire to collect stuff. What you have already is part of the beauty of your universe. You know, I don't think... One guy came to me and he said, I heard what you said, I'm going to go home and sell all my antiques. And I said, if you really heard it, you wouldn't have to. You know, because there's no form to the spirit. Do you think because Buddha didn't have any antiques, you shouldn't? And if you don't have antiques, you'll be holier than Buddha? I mean, it doesn't work that way. Doesn't that work way? So I think you respect, you, you kind of start to simplify your life a little bit. You find, I mean, I enjoy when I'm working with dying people, the pleasure they get from giving away a lot of things they've had to people they know that love them. And sometimes I make long lists with them of who they'll give everything to. And they have a pleasure letting go. And they think, why didn't I give it to her a long time ago? You know? And it's really interesting to just play with how much the moment is to you enough in its simplest form. And I've lived so many times in rooms where there's just a mat and uh, a cup and a wa my toilet kit, watering stuff, you know, toiling stuff, and um, a couple of changes of clothes and a blanket. And I mean, I've lived that way for months at a time in India and then came back to the amount of stuff that I had accumulated that was necessary. And I, I mean, that perspective just showed me how delightful it was and how irrelevant it was. And I think when you fully see that it's irrelevant, you can fully enjoy it. I think when you're afraid of losing it, it dims the fun of it. So is that dealing with the question at all? The question was asked, Ramdas, how can I deal with my anger? I think if you if you have cultivated if you cultivate um, a spacious awareness that embraces life as it's occurring, in life there are frustrations, in life there are angers, they will arise, they will arise. The question is going to be how much your awareness clings to the anger not whether the anger arises, because there are justifiable reasons for anger. And what, what, she, what you can do as you work on yourself and get more spacious is you can hear and grieve with and allow a person that they have a reasonable, a good reason for anger, and at the same moment cultivate, help them cultivate the spaciousness around it so that that's not all they are is angry. All right? That's what... what as she works on herself, that's what she can offer them. You know, it's like working with the dying. It's the same thing. They're busy dying. I have the pain of empathy for their dying and their pain and their fear and all of it. I also have a, a total acceptance of what's happening. And that comes through me too. And that is reassuring to that person and gives them space so that they aren't busy just being a person dying. Right. So... Um, they call, they talk about, um, um, 
that as your mind gets quieter, there is a kind of a lucidity, a clarity, in which you sort of begin to stand back enough to sense the implications of action. You see what creates new suffering. And you see that when, you're, you, when, you're there, when you invest in the anger with identification, you ultimately polarize and create more suffering. But there is a kind of an anger like a, a Zen monk beating a student. It's the question of whether the anger is rooted in love or rooted in the biggest spaciousness. That would be the question. That's what we're talking about. She's talking about the process of letting go of the process of wanting to be special to somebody else. I don't know why you have to let it go. You just have to let go of your attachment to it. I mean, I can live with somebody and we love each other a lot. And I say, am I special to you? Oh, very special. And then we both laugh. I mean, we're very special because that's the drama of it. You know, am I special? Of course. And then behind it, here we are. And this is a moment of beauty and truth. And this is what we got. This is it. This is it. The thing is, you begin to see your personality needs as insatiable. That one need just gets substituted with another sooner or later. Somebody says, you're very special to me. The next question is, you know, but really? Or are you special enough to, you know... And it's back with this question about feelings of lack of self-love. That when you find the place in yourself where you just are, you are. And you are unique. And you are part of the universe. And you're one with God. And it's all empty. And it's all dream stuff. And it's all true. And here we are. All of it. And sometimes you may say, you know, you're not special for me. And if I really am spacious in my awareness, I see your mouth open and these words come out and you're telling me about you, not about me. I'm a beautiful human being. If you don't like me, that's your problem, not mine. Unless I buy it. You don't like me? Ooh. Well, maybe next life. I'll wait. Where are we going to go? Yeah. I mean, you still have to play with it. You just play with it because you see the intensity of the drama and how the world turns and how on and on it goes, the whole stuff of personality. And so, as Danny and Tara suggest, you become mindful of it. You begin to be aware of how it all works. You keep seeing yourselves doing repetitive patterns. And you can spend the rest of your life trying to work them out and interpret and understand and analyze and work on them. Or you can treat them as thoughts or phenomena. They are phenomena, and they're going to go on because you do have a personality and you do have a body. And there are nesting feelings and there's connectedness feelings. And I mean, there are many of my friends, if they don't have a home and a family, they are feeling extremely unable to do inner work. And for others, their home and their family seems a tremendous obstacle. For some of my friends, wandering, like for me, it seems to be a wonderful sadhana. I find great peace in just being this kind of liquidity. Others are wandering and they're miserable. I think it's less interesting what form your life is in than this state of your being. And as your state of your being gets deeper, you can take the forms, whichever ones arise, and kind of work with them. And that includes sickness and dying and opportunities and lack of opportunities and being around miserable people or being around beautiful people or being frustrated. Great sadnesses. Personality is like the sandpaper. It's the stuff of the incarnation. 
And the art is to, I mean, I see my own personality as, as extremely, uh, first of all, it's like, um, it's like looking at these trees. Each of them has its own unique characteristic, but they're beautiful and they're, I appreciate them. I appreciate the trees. I don't have to judge them. I appreciate them. And I find I don't have to judge people either. I can just appreciate them. And even when they say, I don't think you're special, I really see that as their mind speaking now. And I've learned not to... Everybody has these mind nets of reality that they put out, these huge nets like Dr. Strange comics. Yeah. And they're saying, this is who I am, this is who you are, this is who I am, this is who you are, this is what reality is, and they're really strong. And if you've got... You know, if you have a parent, two parents that have a strong one of those, you buy in and it takes you a long time. It's like a tuna being netted, you know. You got caught in a mind net. And what I see is I meet each person and it's like projective systems coming towards you. Each person is looking at you and telling you who they think you are. And what they're seeing is the projections of their own relation to their father or whatever it is. They don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. How could they know? The question was asked, is there a place for passion in our lives? Well, the result is what it is, and the thing is what it is. You don't have to say lovely or not lovely. It's just change. It's a new moment after that. Each moment leads into a new moment. There's just karmic unfolding of these things unfolding. And you can be more or less identified with the process of that which changes, which are the passions, the evolution, the creativity, the horror, the stuff. That's all the storyline of life. And the question is, what is your relationship to it? Is that you? Or is it something you are dancing through? Where are you? Is there a you in this? Or set of phenomena. I'll tell you, well, it's great, but uh, the reason you use division is to get free of having been stuck in one place. Once you're free of that, then you can be like you and have it all together. The question was asked, I'm a lawyer. How can I be an effective legal adversary going head to head with people in the courtroom and yet keep my heart open? Having passed through the 60s where I saw all of us wear white and flowers in our hair and speak softly, and then seeing how that itself was a, it was a, a thing we did, but it wasn't, didn't resonate the de deepest truth of our beings. And then later when things fell apart in communes, you saw those same flower children full of anger and you know, all kinds of stuff that was heavy and dark. They still had to work with. Um, and I think that um, I work a lot with the Bhagavad Gita in which God is saying to Krishna, uh, Krishna is saying to Arjuna, um, in your incarnation as a warrior, you do battle because that's your part to play in the dance. But you do it as an offering to me and you do it with me in your heart. But you still do it impeccably. You don't, because at one point, Arjuna looked and he said, he threw down his, his sword. He said, I can't fight. I mean, I, I love the people on the other side. And this is a very peculiar holy book in which Krishna is saying, for the dance to go on, people have parts to play in it. And if you get caught in your part, whatever it is, or the tone of it even, it starts to be, you start to lose. You, you just get caught in reinforcing the, the nature of the reality of the game. Now, if the game needs to be played in the society, because it's part of law, a part of a system to make it work, then you, gotta, then you can take it as sadhana for yourself. You can take it so that you can be the fiercest human being on earth, and yet the quality of your compassion can be so deep that it, it, I'll tell you the thing that's so far to me 
is the way in which, and I've mentioned this here already, I think this past week, is the way my guru used the word jiao or split or get lost as a way of saying, I love you, I'm holding you, you can never get away from me. And he was saying, jiao, jiao, jiao. And I have watched and met people who are extremely fierce. But when I look into their hearts with my heart, we're right here together. It's just that the fierceness is the appropriate role. It's like when you play tennis with somebody. You collaborate to compete. Now, if you are both a collaborator and a competitor, you're what's called a good sport. Now, you might have an adversarial relationship with somebody else who really thinks they're an adversary. That's not good sportsmanship. Or, on the other hand, if they really think they're God and screw the adversarial, they're not a good player on the field. Your art is to keep all of the planes going at once. And then here, how... Because you can imbue adversarialness with just firm sharpness and intellectual design that allows you to set boundaries, learning how to set boundaries. But it doesn't necessarily have to do with your heart. Now, the problem is that at the stage you're at where you want support like this for your heart to do its work, sometimes it's, it's pretty hard to work in a situation where everybody thinks they're real and they're all adversarial. You know, because you've got nobody to resonate off of. And that's the stage one is at. At certain stages, one really needs a lot of external support. And later you don't. Later you don't. And when you don't need it back from somebody else, you're just kind of emitting it. And then you're amazed at how somebody who you thought was terribly adversarial suddenly, you know, at the coffee machine or something says, you know, I was just having an experience where everything was synchronous. And I <laughs> Am I dealing with the question? Good. It's a good adversary. It's one really worthy of you. And your whole question is whether you can be that effectively adversarial if your heart isn't in it, is what you're saying. No, I no, but we're using it the other way. I'm talking about the way you said, can I be an adversarial if I don't think it's real, if I'm not really pushing? Yeah. Uh, we just, we said the same thing. It was just the opposite way of saying it. Uh, I, uh, my best estimate is you can be better. You can be better. I think we're so used to thinking that to, to project energy out into the world to change other consciousness, you need to be totally identified with being the actor. And I think it's the other way around. I think when you're not identified at all, you are both you and you're the person you're talking to. You don't get so lost in your game and you hear exactly what needs to be said and how it needs to be said in order to change that person's consciousness, which is why you're getting angry in the first place. The question was asked, our political system seems so militaristic and so wrong. Is there any dharmic way to act within the system? I'm a, um, uh, a member, because of my incarnation, of a number of, of systems, of which one is a political system. And in order to honor my incarnation, it means that I'm a citizen. And I have to, whatever that means, I have to be part of it. It's a process that I have to be part of. And that if I push it away, it's got me. Or if I become obsessed with it, it's got me. What I have to do is find a way to be, to fulfill it, to be, play my part, to be all the different roles I have in the world, to just fulfill them, not to be lost in them or to reject them, but just to do what I have to do in each one. And in my understanding of the political system and as a lack, as a non-compassionate one or a relatively uncompassionate one, I feel a part of me feels incredible pain, just as you do. I mean, I work in Guatemala, so I do understand what, how culpable our government is for the suffering that's going on to these beautiful Mayan people. When I look at the politicians involved, I can empathize with how they got into that predicament. 
I see the forces acting upon them inside themselves and in the social structures they're working in. And I realize that I'm part of the web of it all. For example, I know that it's my choosing to drive my car someplace that is feeding something in the system that is leading to our Middle East policy that is leading to, there's a way in which I'm a conspirator in the whole game. And so what I feel is that I often externalize the blame. I often say, you know, if he were good, things would be wonderful without realizing that I'm part of the web. Uh, I feel that in, in the issue, like in Aikido, that when you have somebody that you feel is doing the wrong thing or a negative force or a dark force and you want to act against it, there has to be a way to act appreciating their energy in a way so that the result of the interaction is, as, as Gandhi said, I want the British to leave India, but I want them to leave as friends. It's that one that if I see Casper and all the people that that represents um, as them to be pushed against with all of my being, what I do is give them power. And there is another way in which they are that part of us that represents that part of the system. In other words, I'm talking about planes again, where I see we're us here, but we're also them there. And I will say, no, you can't do this, or this is wrong, or I'll vote against you, or I'm going to put out an ad saying that you are irresponsible and you shouldn't be reelected or whatever. At the same moment is the question is where my heart is in relation to that. And whether I externalize and project outward or whether I just say this is part of the web of the human condition, of which I'm part and they're part, and in my dance, I have this moral code and this set of awarenesses that leads me to say, because I'm representing the woman in Guatemala that the government is screwing, I have the responsibility to say this, but how I say it is the next question, not that I say it. And who I see I'm saying it to is as important. And the interesting thing is whether you can be a really good adversary in a way that draws you closer together. Or does adversarial things have to take you apart? Am I dealing with that question at all? No. The question was asked, but what about the bad guys? How can we deal with them? You must have seen, you, you must have seen in your own life that you've done things that have caused suffering. And you've done things that have been very compassionate. And you see that behind that is somebody who does things that hurt others and does things that are compassionate. And the things are the hurtful things and the compassionate things. You are neither or both hurtful or compassionate. You just are. You see that in yourself. Are there wicked people that are born wicked? Well, that's why I introduced you to Ravana in that sexist story I was reading, because Ravana is really a bad guy. He happens to be a high yogi that just took a heavy birth. I mean, I don't know about Hitler. Maybe Hitler is a really high yogi that just was, you know, you get behind it by getting behind it in yourself. That as you connect behind so that you're not identified with your actions, one of the injunctions of the Bhagavad Gita is be not identified with being the actor. So you get behind it into awareness and then there are these actions, these phenomena occurring. My heart's beating, my hand is moving, my mouth is moving, words are coming out. You're there, there's a response. This is all a set of phenomena happening. Where am I in relation to this? Am I talking to you? Or am I silent and there is talking to you? Just play with it. No, I'm not. You're hearing, you're assuming, you're identifying me with the action that's happening at the moment. I am neither talking to you nor not talking to you because samsara and nirvana are as one, as that woman was pointing out. The question was asked, is it possible to be truthful and yet play within the political structure? To me, the most interesting possibility in the political world is truth. And I feel 
the truth is very scary and it's a lot. And looking directly at suffering and looking directly at miracles and looking directly at possibility and looking directly at craziness and looking directly at our fears and all of it, that there is such a starvation for people being their message, living their message or saying what they are or coming from that place of the truth of their being that I find myself very resistant to editing my material or selecting it in order to not scare people away. Because um, I can't speak down to you. You are me, and we are just reflecting together. And I can't say, well, I can't tell you that because it might scare you off. I, it, it somehow treating you as as if you're less capable of handling what I can see to be my truth than I can. And I don't think that's true. I think everybody in this room can handle what I can handle. And I would like to look as baldly as I can at what is. And I mean, I find myself increasingly involved in politics and in issues about new parties and in helping uh, you know, different political candidates and doing benefits and all of this and finding that I'm growing up. I have to be a participant in the political life and I have to represent the values I believe in. And um, I'm just learning that. I mean, I'm a child compared to you in that and I, I could learn from somebody like you. But, but I... Um, like, for example, um, I've had a lot of long dialogues with Jerry Brown. And uh, Jerry and I have known each other for a long time. And I watched that when Jerry was not, this is years back now, when Jerry was not the object of the press interest, he was extremely straight. And the minute the power trip came when there was a possibility he could have vast power to do good. He started to be deceptive. He started to package his message for consumption of the consumer. And I saw he lost the juice that came through speaking from the heart of truth at that moment. I mean, this is what I experienced. And this was 12 years ago or 10 years ago or something like that in Baltimore, as I recall. And I look around in the political arena and I see many people that are um, indignant, that are righteous, that are hurt, that are frustrated, that are caring, that are compassionate. But I see damn few menches. I mean, full beings. I see people who haven't done their homework. They aren't working on themselves. They're, they got caught in doing good with power. It's like Maharaji said about powers, siddhis, the spiritual powers to do. He said, powers are pig shit. <laughs> That's what he said. He said that they're for children. They're for things to play around and screw around. They're not the real thing. And Shirdi Sai Baba, who's a great saint, said, who was a... Uh, miracles all over the place. He kept saying, I give them what they want so they'll want what I give. But he knew that wasn't the truth of the thing. And my feeling is that we are coming out of such an obsession with third chakra power that we figure we... we you know, I, you know I, I've read the words love is power or love is the greatest power so many times that they've lost any meaning for me. I mean, they're those kind of words you read in books and on Hallmark cards and stuff, and they don't do it. But then, you know, I'm working along in my inner work and my studies, and I come to a great wise thing, my love is power. And it blows me away. I mean, I suddenly realized that was true. It had been trivialized, and it was true. And I would like to support 
that kind of participation in the political dialogue that searches for that level of truth of being. And because I think that's where the healing comes. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you. <laughs>